Good morning. For 33 years at this time, I've been standing in front of this audience um, introducing our uh, Taubman lecturer. Uh, I think that this lectureship is now one of the most sustained lectureships uh, in the institution. It is simply outstanding for us to be gathered here again uh, to have this uh, sustained look at critical care excellence. Um, <clears throat> this is the Gregory Mark Taubman Memorial Lectureship. Gregory was the son of Joel and Sonia Taubman, brother of Stacy and Gary. Joel, Stacy, and Gary are here. Um, <clears throat> he was a fifth grader at the Potomac Elementary School, was an outstanding student, uh, excelled in athletics, and was his class president. At the age of 11, Gregory succumbed to the effects of Rye syndrome in the pediatric ICU at Children's Hospital, as it was called at that time. Despite the application of every form of neurointensive care and therapy that we uh, knew of at the time. The failure of our therapy uh, to help Gregory um, underscores the lack of understanding of both the pathophysiology of the Rye syndrome, which has now inexplicably disappeared, essentially, uh, and also the frontiers of critical care medicine that we have to be pushing uh, ever back. This lecture fund was created in 1978, both to honor the memory of Gregory and to push back those frontiers. Uh, initially, we focused on Rye syndrome, but we quickly ran out of topics with Rye syndrome and speakers because we knew so little about it, and shortly thereafter, uh, the disease began to disappear. So we then shifted the focus to the frontiers of critical care medicine uh, and to pursue the intellectual goal of advancing critical care knowledge. During the course of this lectureship, leaders from all over the world, Sweden, Israel, England, Boston, other places uh, around uh, the United States have all come here. Uh, they have represented all forms of critical care medicine, anesthesia, adult critical care, surgery, and the like. Uh, and it has become one of the focal points of the educational environment uh, for critical care throughout this community. In October of 2007, Children's dedicated a four-bed neurointensive care unit in honor of Gregory Mark Taubman as a result of fundraising efforts led by the family. And I want to specifically acknowledge Richie Cohen, who is here as well, who's been a stalwart donor as well. In addition, the Taubman family and friends have made a generous contribution to the completion of the Bayer Comprehensive Media Room, uh, which is now relocated into the Cardiac Intensive Care Unit, uh, which will be dedicated at 9.30 this morning, and you're all invited to that opening ceremony. Uh, here to introduce this year's 33rd Taubman Lecturer is David Wessel, Senior Vice President for Hospital Specialists. Thank you, uh, Peter. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Steve Abman, who is the Taubman Lecturer this year. Dr. Uh, Abman is Professor of Pediatric Pulmonary Medicine and Director of the Pediatric Heart Lung Center and Co-Director of the Pulmonary Hypertension Program and faculty member of the Clinical Sciences Graduate Program in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Colorado uh, and the Denver School and the Children's Hospital of Aurora, Colorado. Uh, Steve is a longtime friend and colleague uh, in critical care and pulmonary medicine. Uh, he has made seminal contributions to the discovery of mechanisms and treatment of pulmonary hypertension I think there are few pediatric clinical researchers in the world that can claim the accomplishments and broad range of success in basic as well as clinical research and clinical care that belong to Dr. Abman. His CV is measured not in pages uh, but in inches. Uh, one of my division chiefs looked at his CV after I sent it to her uh, in an email and I think her short email reply to me really succinctly describes Steve Abman's career. She said, 
you have to be kidding. <laughs> Steve has more than 300 publications and they're in not so shabby journals, including many senior author publications in the New England Journal of Medicine, in Lancet, uh, in uh, Pediatrics, the Journal of Pediatrics. But interestingly, he also has leading publications in basic science journals, the American Journal of Physiology and Biochemistry journals. Uh, he <coughs> has won awards from many of the major societies, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Society of Pediatric Research, the American Heart Association. The awards have been for outstanding research, outstanding mentor, outstanding teacher, outstanding clinician, the accolades go on for pages. He's produced seminal work in the understanding of the treatment of pulmonary hypertension, and he has changed the way we care for patients. He is the consummate bench to bedside doctor and embodies the full spectrum of T1 to T3 research. It's my great pleasure to introduce today Dr. Steve Abman, the 33rd annual Taubin Memorial Lecture. Great. Thank you very much, uh, David. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. And uh, David was very kind in his introduction. Um, I reminded David at dinner last night that it's our, probably our 20th anniversary. <laughs> I've known David over the, over the years around nitric oxide and its biology. And uh, David's been a tremendous uh, role model and leader in the field. And uh, it's just a pleasure to be here. It's especially a pleasure to have met the Taubin family and uh, their dedication to improving uh, outcomes of kids uh, with critical illness is striking, uh, partly through this lectureship of ongoing interactions. We all grow and learn from these kinds of visits, especially for me, it's been fantastic. But I think it'll have an impact that's longstanding in your son's memory. And it's also been a pleasure to, uh, to meet Peter Holbrook, who over the years as a leader of pediatric critical care has done a fantastic job of putting the field on the roadmap and really getting everything launched uh, nationally, internationally, along with the outstanding work that he's done here. So it's really a, a, a privilege of mine to be here, and I'm very honored to have been asked to speak on this topic. And the topic is really translating discovery into ICU therapeutics. What I feel is quite essential for this area is the uh, important role of the clinician scientist <laughs> and how there are certain stresses during education and training and, and as a field uh, that have created a lot of barriers for sustaining the clinician scientist. So I'll speak briefly about that and then talk about how nitric oxide uh, has become an example of how one can go from bench to bedside in terms of thinking about uh, strategies to improve outcomes with critical uh, care uh, related illnesses. But first I should say I have no conflicts of uh, interest or relationships with industry related to this talk. Well, critical care medicine it remains a challenging and vexing field, a very exciting and demanding field, and it can be extraordinarily rewarding. And it really brings together the excitement of new technology with understanding physiology and making the right decisions at the right time. And when it comes together, it's a, a spectacular feeling, and, it, and few fields are this rewarding. This is an example of an extremely preterm infant who had multi-organ system failure who had severe pulmonary hypertension, who had a prolonged course in our critical care setting, ended up having a tracheostomy with chronic ventilation, then over time has developed into a delightful young lady, as shown here. Uh, there's nothing more rewarding than being there from the get-go in her course and seeing her through, and then celebrating with the family at the time of her decannulation. And to see such an outcome is really a privilege. And yet, uh, as, the, as the, one of the Denver newspapers used to say as their slogan, beware the satisfied man. And I love that slogan because we have so many challenges ahead of us. And I think the way we, we need to, to really look forward towards what we could do to better improve outcomes of kids who have multiple different diseases, especially in the ICU or NICU setting. So I think one aspect that's very important in terms of translating discovery into ICU therapies is related to this powerful collaboration between the research mission and excellence in clinical care. And I think that is so vital for us to sustain those as emphases. 
I worry quite a bit that we've developed silos between sections, uh, silos between medical education, where our ultimate goals are in terms of the quality of physicians or practitioners of all different sorts, and that we really need to learn how to better blend clinical care along with research, education, training, and advocacy. What I think is really clear from what David said in his introduction and what I've seen visiting National Children's here is that the message to the community as research is valued here. And in some ways, this seems to be fairly straightforward that yes, research informs and enhances clinical care. But sometimes this message is forgotten in our day-to-day -day activities and with all the financial stresses of healthcare systems. I think we also know that clinical expertise enriches research. So it's really a two-way street, isn't it? And its impact on understanding and treating disease is so important. And I worry if that we have too much of a silo between the basic scientists and their success with the laboratory, that bringing such discoveries into the bedside or into the community will lag behind. And so it's absolutely important that this interface of clinical care and research uh, come together to provide learning opportunities that can enhance quality of life, long practice skills, even in those who don't undertake academic careers per se, but especially to enrich our ability to develop new technologies in their application. Well, how does the public view us? And I have a couple of citations here. One's from uh, the Wall Street Journal, which has some of the more interesting science-related articles in it, uh, even beyond the New England Journal, I think, as well as more recently in Newsweek magazine. And the idea is that uh, all the success in the laboratory, NPR radio will talk about a new discovery for cancer in mice. But the public is wondering where are the cures for human disease? And both of these articles identify the fact that one of the barriers is that we need more physician researchers to uh, move cures out of the rat's cage. And what this, New England, this, this Wall Street Journal article uh, stated was this. The contrast between the success of basic science in treating disease in animals and its failure to do so in human patients threatens to shred the implicit social contract between the public and the biomedical research establishment. Pretty dramatic writing. The reasons more of the exciting discoveries that fill science journals have not moved from bench to bedside or legion, but they specifically identify that the physician scientist is an endangered species. And indeed, clinician scientists are so valuable. There was an old article called uh, Bewitched, Beloved, but Bewildered when describing this species, this population. And it's defined broadly as those with an MD degree who devote a substantial percent of their professional effort to research along the entire spectrum of biomedical inquiry. Well, the reasons why they're necessary is because of this growing gap between practicing clinicians and how we train them and biomedical scientists. And they're specifically trained to ask clinically relevant questions in health research that lead to development of projects linking the basic and clinical sciences. So another way of thinking about what's happened over time is that as I've traveled and go to different centers, uh, it's clear that team science needs promotion to help develop these links between these concepts. The ideas of new pathways to discovery from the laboratory or clinical setting are important. Developing research teams of the future, which embraces the differences in background and brings them together to better highlight the needs and achieve uh, the ability to bring them to our patients. And that it requires re-engineering our entire clinical research enterprise, our traditional way of thinking about our approach in academic centers. As David mentioned then, the whole spectrum of bench to bedside to community is vital to have this linkage. That is the preclinical work and the clinical findings, and then finally applying them to populations in a variety of different approaches, either with outcome studies or multi-center randomized trials. These are absolutely essential. And it's key that different players can play contributing roles. The basic scientists, clinicians and scientists, but especially the clinician scientist in the middle who helps bridge this gap. Well, it's been my privilege over the years to work with fantastic people at the University of Colorado. And I, I cherish this photograph because they're some of my favorite people, but they're people that some of you know, I think. They all trained around the same time. But I really like to show it for a variety of reasons. Number one, the first is John Kinsella. He's a neonatologist. 
The second is Dunbar Ivey. He's now head of our cardiology group. The third is Annie Halbauer, who now heads our sleep program in pulmonary medicine. Then the fourth is David Cornfield, uh, who's now head of critical care in pulmonary at Stanford University. <laughs> and I like to show this because we have critical care, pulmonary, cardiology, neonatology, and others coming together to help problem solve at both the bench and the bedside what we feel are very vexing issues that no single specialty has ownership of and that we can enrich our outcomes by working together. I also like to see this because it takes me back a number of years and reminds me in our laboratory meetings that John Dunbar and David used to look at each other's foreheads and, and to argue who's getting balder faster and, uh, and I have a lot of fond memories of that era. But as a group what we really targeted was this problem of pulmonary hypertension in children. And this is a slide showing severe and devastating pulmonary vascular disease. This is supposed to be a blood vessel in the middle of your screen there. And you can see there's dramatic occlusion of this small pulmonary artery by growth within the lining of the vessel, as well as excessive growth around or in the wall of the vessel itself. And this wasn't an adult who died with severe idiopathic disease. This was a child who died with this kind of devastating structural disease of their vasculature. So it remains a very severe problem, and I feel that the kids with pulmonary hypertension have long been underserved. And in part, we know that pulmonary hypertension is a critical determinant of morbidity and mortality in diverse settings, be it cardiac, lung, or hematologic diseases, other systemic diseases in many settings. What's really important to remember as well is that advances in basic pulmonary vascular biology have directly led to novel therapies. That is, work in particular about the endothelial cell, which I'll describe to you shortly, has identified three significant pathways, one of which is the nitric oxide signaling pathway. And from these early studies, they rapidly led to different interventions and therapeutic strategies. And targeting these three pathways still remain the focus of a lot of our pharmacologic efforts to improve outcomes. And certainly over time, we've improved our ability to enhance survival and quality of life of children with pulmonary hypertension, but we have a long, long way to go. So historically then, again, this is the era where I first got to know David, was the idea that newborns with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure have significant morbidity and mortality. This is a child amongst all the technology you see here. You see a baby who's being oscillated. You can see the baby is on extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or ECMO therapy, a form of cardiac bypass. And there's also a tank of nitric oxide in the background there. And it shows you the kind of technologies that were needed to really resuscitate and uh, save this, this child uh, because of severe respiratory failure along with pulmonary hypertension. Now this problem of respiratory failure in the term newborn is complicated by the diversity of clinical settings in which we see this condition. And these x-rays illustrate some of those. We see idiopathic PPHN or persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn in which the lung fields are relatively oligemic or hypoperfused due to severe extrapulmonary shunt and yet very little in the way of parenchymal lung disease. We see babies below, for example, with pneumonia where the x-ray shows significant parenchymal disease, severe pulmonary hypertension, but really a different uh, sort of physiologic uh, problems. Meconium aspiration and then finally diaphragmatic hernia with uh, its uh, uh, lung hypoplasia as the underlying feature, are all different forms of persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn that remain challenges to this day. And the reason why a lot of these diseases are lumped together as a syndrome of PPHN is they all represent physiologically the failure of the lung circulation to adapt to postnatal stimuli. That we know in fetal life, pulmonary vascular resistance is extremely high limiting blood flow to the lung, and that rapidly within minutes to hours after birth, there's a dramatic decrease in resistance, allowing about an eight-fold increase in pulmonary blood flow to allow the successful transition to normal life. We know that increased oxygenation and ventilation and stretch and the release of endogenous vasodilators, including nitric oxide, all contribute to this normal process. But for some reason, in babies who have persistent pulmonary hypertension, there are prenatal influences that alter reactivity of the blood vessels, alter the structure of the blood vessels, and so in response to the same birth-related stimuli, 
we see the sustained elevation of pulmonary hypertension, leading to severe hypoxemia and respiratory and sometimes cardiac failure. So the hypothesis of our laboratory over the decades, and as well as others, has primarily focused on the vital role of the endothelial cell in modulating vascular growth and function during development. And our early studies were related to nitric oxide, which is largely produced by the vascular endothelium in normal settings, which then plays a significant role in achieving this vasodilation at birth, limiting smooth muscle cell hyperproliferation, and decreasing excessive production of the adventitia, or the matrix. In addition, more recently, we've been interested in the idea that nitric oxide itself affects the endothelial cells, their survival, their growth, angiogenesis per se, and perhaps signaling to the epithelium itself in terms of how to grow normal lung structure over time. And I'll speak to that with some of our more recent laboratory data. And then finally, there are other mediators. In this case, it's endothelin, a potent vasoconstrictor. And this is an example of another role for nitric oxide, in which clearly having sufficient nitric oxide is important for shutting down vasoconstrictors, as well as other inflammatory stimuli which may lead to vasoconstriction and a lot of the structural changes in the vasculature, as in the slide I showed you before, which shows the devastating vascular disease that can occur. Well, over the years, then, we've done a lot of work. We identified that nitric oxide is important at the time of birth, that if you block the ability to make nitric oxide, you produce a PPHN-type physiology in our LAM models. We also found early on that inhaled nitric oxide is a potent and selective pulmonary vasodilator in fetal lambs. <coughs> so that is, this is work that John Kinsella led in our laboratory. And you see in the lower panel blood flow in fe a fetal lamb prior to birth. You can see it's very low. We then initiate ventilation with epoxic gas so that the fetal PO2 remains below 20 torr. <laughs> and you can see with ventilation alone, there's a rise in flow. And then simply adding nitric oxide, in this case at 20 parts per million, caused a very rapid, potent, and sustained rise in pulmonary blood flow that was sustained despite having fetal PO2s and despite having a lung that's still uh, ventilated uh, under hypoxic conditions, showing the ability of the lamb to respond uh, immensely to this novel dilator. Previous F efforts for a number of different vasodilator stimuli failed to show any response that's paralleled this, so we were quite excited. The upper panel illustrates the selective nature of this vasodilation. It shows that there's a nice fall in pulmonary artery pressure, or PAP, <laughs> as shown on this slide, and yet systemic pressure remained untouched, remained normal. So the idea of a selected vasodilator to use in the clinical setting of the disease was very strong and led to some early clinical observations in which we started to use nitric oxide in babies who had qualified for ECMO therapy. And indeed, this slide shows an early series in which there's a marked improvement in PO2 that was sustained throughout this 24-hour period and led to if such improvement that ECMO therapy was no longer required in that setting. And certainly, at the time, in the, in the late 90s, the early 90s, we introduced nitric oxide. There's dramatic fall in our need for ECMO utilization. You know, David Wessel has very similar slides from what happened at Boston Children's, as do other investigators. And with multi-center randomized clinical trials, and these are three of the largest studies, one sees a consistent story of a reduction of the need for ECMO therapy in term <laughs> newborns with severe pulmonary hypertension. The part of the slide that we always look at, of course, beware the satisfied man, and uh, is the 40% failure rate in each of these studies. That is, you can see that in each of these settings that there wasn't complete resolution of the need for ECMO therapy. And so that's the population that's now being targeted. And so a lot of laboratory work from our group and many, many others has demonstrated that perhaps if we think about nitric cyclic uh, GMP signaling, one can better improve therapeutic approaches. One of the most exciting is the use of sildenafil or Viagra as a PDE5 inhibitor, and that acts by enhancing cyclic GMP in the setting of perhaps impaired nitric oxide production <laughs> or an inability of nitric oxide to work on the soluble guanylate cyclase for which it is targeted, or perhaps other agents like soluble guanylate cyclase activators, as illustrated here. And so these have come out then in both laboratory studies and clinical studies 
as perhaps being the next approach that will enhance and reduce this 40% failure rate. Again, going back to the laboratory, this is our animal model of pulmonary hypertension in our sheep. And we show that pulmonary vascular resistance falls to nitric oxide, as you can see by the asterisk, was significantly significant. We then shut off the nitric, infused sildenafil, and saw an even better response. And we further show that if you combine nitric oxide with sildenafil, we have further augmentation of the vasodilation. And this is ongoing uh, clinical work that is now exploring these questions. Now, David and Robin Steinhardt and John Kinsella have been looking at this. They did some pilot work looking at intravenous sildenafil, again, this PDE5 inhibitor, and shows that it can improve oxygenation in newborns with PPHN, and some clinical trials are currently underway. Now, we get a kick out of this, of course, because the idea of using Viagra for kids, uh, especially when we first started doing this, was viewed as somewhat crazy. Uh, this is from one of our patients who's actually featured in, in a Newsweek article. But we had Inside Edition and others visit, uh, astounded that we would dare breach this kind of approach, not thinking about the pharmacology or physiology, but rather the idea that this is a drug for erectile dysfunction. How could we consider it for kids? But times have changed, and now it's one of the most commonly used therapies for both acute and chronic pulmonary hypertension. And then finally, as related to pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, we're excited by the so-called uh, soluble guanylate cyclase activators. In this case, it's a drug called Sinasiguat. And at least in our experimental models of PPHN, when we deliver these lambs and we induce very severe pulmonary hypertension, one can see that there's a fall in pulmonary vascular resistance from baseline with nitric oxide at 20 and 40, at 40 parts per million, but that the Sinasiguat itself has a more potent and a very striking response than even nitric oxide in the setting of this experimental model, at least. And the idea here is that with nitric oxide targeting soluble guanylate cyclase is that under a number of conditions like oxidative stress, the ability to respond to nitric oxide is dramatically reduced. And so an agent like an SGC activator, which is still capable of stimulating soluble guanylate cyclase in this oxidized state may provide yet another therapeutic strategy for refractory cases. So by way of interim summary then for PPHN, nitric oxide cyclic GMP signaling contributes to normal lung vascular growth throughout development. It's essential for the normal transition of the lung circulation at birth and is markedly impaired in both experimental and clinical persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn and that we're often responsive to inhaled NO therapy, and yet we need better treatments, such as PDE5 inhibitors, SGC activators, perhaps others, for more NO-resistant forms of pulmonary hypertension that may be refractory to nitric oxide treatment. So during the time that we're still continuing to explore PPHN and doing better with the term newborn, a lot of our attention and others has turned to the preterm infant, as illustrated here. And there have been remarkable advances in terms of the outcomes of our most extremely preterm infant through improvements of respiratory care, surfactant therapy, and many other perinatal uh, treatments. But we still see babies with severe PPHN physiology or preterm who seem very responsive to nitric oxide. But one of the questions that we raised, as well as others, what about long-term issues in terms of lung vascular growth as well as lung structural growth, the distal airspace. In other words, one of the major sequelae we still see of preterm infants is that they have sustained abnormalities of both vascular and alveolar growth that lead to chronic lung disease. And the chronic lung disease or bronchopulmonary dysplasia is associated with the need for recurrent hospitalizations, exercise intolerance, late risk for pulmonary hypertension and other problems, uh, which are illustrated by some of these slides here. This slide illustrates a patient who has severe pulmonary hypertension and BPD. But what I want you to notice is in the lower right-hand corner is that we have lung tissue from a child who died with BPD, and it shows a very simplified lung architecture. In other words, you have very few uh, signs of septation or alveolarization. We've stained those brown spots in the lower right corner there, illustrate staining for the endothelial cells within the distal lung. That's von Willebrand's factor. You see a paucity of vessels that have formed and a relatively dysmorphic appearing circulation. 
And just to the left of that, it shows the angiogram of a patient who, di who had severe pulmonary hypertension and BPD and shows marked pruning of the lung circulation. In other words, you see a skinny branch light up during the angiogram with very few branches coming off that conducting pulmonary artery, showing signs of persistently impaired lung growth. So the challenge here is how to improve not just pulmonary hypertension, but how to enhance lung vascular growth itself. Some of the problems we see in our ICUs, or when these babies come back with a viral illness, as illustrated by this chest x-ray, they require re-intubation, prolonged stays in our intensive care units, and they're profoundly hypoxemic. Part of it's related to the fact that with a limited pulmonary circulation, the ability to redistribute their pulmonary blood flow to improve gas exchange is markedly impaired. So these children remain considerably fragile throughout infancy, leading to the recurrent hospitalizations and late morbidity. So the question is then, how can we better then enhance lung structure and to do this on a persistent and chronic basis? So as we think about the pathogenesis of bronchopulmonary dysplasia as illustrated here, we know that both prenatal and postnatal injuries to the lung can impair both vascular growth and alveolarization, leading to this chronic lung disease. Traditionally, the focus has been on the airway side, whereas the pulmonary circulation itself has been sort of a poor cousin to the airspace. Uh, I think what's really essential is that perhaps what happens early is that injury to the growing vasculature may actually induce changes that lead to these persistent structural abnormalities of the lung causing bronchopulmonary dysplasia. To explore this then, we went back into the laboratory, and these are data illustrating how if one blocks vascular growth with anti-angiogenesis agents in neonatal rat pups, one blocks alveolarization as well. In the left, you see a control animal at two weeks. At the right, you see animals treated with either thalidomide or fumagillin. Both are nonspecific anti-angiogenesis agents. And each of these then not only impaired vascular growth, but as you can see visually, there's a striking reduction in lung surface area. You see these dilated distal air spaces with very little evidence of septation or alveolarization. So this led to our vascular hypothesis, that is that disruption of angiogenesis or vascular growth during critical periods of lung development can impair alveolarization. And that perhaps that decreased VEGF nitric oxide signaling contributes to the abnormal lung structure in experimental BPD. So the concept is fairly straightforward as illustrated here. That is, there has to be crosstalk between the vasculature or the endothelium and the epithelial side. And that perhaps VEGF from the epithelium, which coordinates growth of the vasculature, not only enhances vascular growth, but the epithelium itself requires trophic factors from the endothelium to enhance its own development. And that disruption of this kind of a signaling system can lead to impaired growth that's sustained throughout childhood. Well, to get that concept more directly, we use the selective VEGF receptor antagonist. We found that if you take a newborn rat pup, do a single injection the day after birth, and follow these animals out during the two weeks of alveolarization, one finds striking impairment of lung growth, including decreased vascular growth. This slide is from angiograms showing control animal at two weeks, showing a nice development of the conducting pulmonary arteries. You see the, the vasculature itself is well established. That blush is all from the microcirculation. However, with this VEGF receptor antagonist, you see striking pruning of the vasculature, a dramatic reduction in vascular growth. And indeed, this is evidenced by not only decreases in vessel growth, but decreases in alveolarization. On the left side, we see a control animal, and all those brown spots where the barium infusion highlights vessels that should normally be there. You could also see a nice lacy structure to the distal lung, showing a, a good surface area. But in contrast, after a single dose of this agent that blocks the EGF, it's hard to find some of these brown spots. And you see this simplified lung structure, dramatic reduction in alveolarization and surface area. So what does this have to do with nitric oxide? Well, nitric oxide has been known to be a downstream mediator of the effects of VEGF on angiogenesis.
So in this animal model, then, if one measures nitric oxide production, it's markedly impaired. If one measures the gene and protein that generate nitric oxide, this endothelial NO synthase, it's markedly downregulated. So Jen Ray Tang and our group decided perhaps we gave nitric oxide back. Can we prevent these structural abnormalities? So as you can see on the left, the control animal, you see a normal looking lung vasculature. In the middle, you see this VEGF receptor effect of pruning of the vessels. And then finally, with giving nitric oxide back, you see sustained growth. You see normalization of the lung structure itself. And these all parallel changes, not just in the vessel growth as illustrated here, but also alveolarization, as shown histologically. Now, a number of people that have played with the idea in the laboratory of whether or not nitric oxide in other models is sufficient to prevent chronic lung disease. In this case, this is the work of Dick Bland that I often cite because I think there's some very telling findings that tell us we're on the right track, and yet nitric oxide itself may not be sufficient for the prevention of chronic lung disease. And what Dick developed when he was in Utah was an animal model of lambs that he ventilates for two or three weeks. He then delivers those animals and studies them physiologically and harvests their tissue for extensive studies. And what he shows is that after three weeks of ventilation, there is a dramatic reduction of endothelial enosynthase, the enzyme that produces nitric oxide. When he then treats these lambs for three weeks with nitric oxide, there's some improvement of lung structure similar to what we showed you before with these neonatal rat pups. That as on the left, you see without nitric oxide, the TRU there stands for terminal respiratory units. You see these relatively dilated, simple looking distal lung structures. On the right with nitric oxide, you still see some persistence of those structural features, and yet there's some effort of septation, some effort of improved alveolarization. So what Dick did then was quantify these changes of alveolarization by something known as doing radial alveolar counts. And indeed, this slide is quite telling in terms of what we should have anticipated when we think about the clinical impact of nitric oxide. And that is one sees that in the preterm animal without nitric oxide that's ventilated, there's a marked reduction in the number of alveoli. That nitric oxide itself induces more than a doubling in terms of alveolarization numbers. So that's a pretty good impact to double the number of alveoli in the distal lung should enhance gas exchange and function. But what's especially striking is what's shown to the right, that if you compare with where this animal's lung should have been, if born a term without chronic ventilation, you can see that we're not nearly half of where we need to be. So good but not sufficient is how I'd look at this. And I think in general that's where we're heading towards what we think about in the clinical setting. Now, there have been a number of studies that have tried to examine the effects of nitric oxide in premature infants to see if one can improve long-term outcomes and especially reduce the incidence of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. There are a number of mechanisms through which nitric oxide may work, one of which may be through the enhanced angiogenic signaling that we were describing experimentally and perhaps by augmenting alveolarization through related mechanisms. It may be that nitric oxide is of benefit through hemodynamic effects or effects on gas exchange or other things as well. But the idea was that perhaps by giving early nitric oxide treatment, one could reduce the risk for BPD. So there have been a number of studies, and part of the problem is that in the field that different babies have been enrolled in these studies, different doses of nitric oxide have been used for different periods of time, so it's really hard to mix and match the findings of many of these things. So I'd like to first show you what we did. This is John Kinsella led this multi-center trial out of Colorado. And overall, in his randomized controlled trial, he found no difference in terms of the effect of nitric oxide on the risk for BPD. However, before randomization, he did stratify according to birth weight. And as you can see on the left, even though there's no difference in a couple of the birth weight strata, that the bigger babies, the babies who were born at about 1,000 grams and above, had more than a 50% reduction in the risk for chronic lung disease. So this suggests that perhaps the phenotypes that we're talking about are quite different, that the impact of perhaps lung development, the stage of development, may be important, and that there may be a signal related to nitric oxide and its benefits. 
And the right you could also see from his data, which is very intriguing finding, is sort of a brain protective effect. And this was very striking, the idea that you could breathe an inhalational gas like nitric oxide, and yet not just have local effects within the lung, but in terms of brain injury, one could see a reduction in the uh, combined endpoints of grade 3, 4 hemorrhage, periventricular leukomalacia or ventriculomegaly has been a very fascinating finding. And so it may be that there are some circulating effects of the nitric oxide that's inhaled, and perhaps that'd be a, another reason for thinking about enotherapy in this setting. Perhaps the largest trial and most successful trial was run by Roberta Ballard, originally from Philadelphia, now in San Francisco. And Roberta found that there was a significant improvement in preterm infants in terms of survival without BPD. What's unique about her study is that she didn't start treatment until about seven days of age. And so that selected a different kind of phenotype for the patients that were enrolled in her trial. And she used higher doses for more prolonged periods than any of the other trials. And so indeed, there's a small but significant trend here. And the entirety of this can be explained by treatment in babies early but not too early. That is, babies who were treated within the first two weeks of life, who we sort of self-selected, they were still ventilator dependent or sick at seven days, those patients seem to have a significant reduction or improvement in terms of survival without BPD. In contrast, waiting beyond the first two weeks seemed to have little impact. And then finally, the most recent study that came out, this is one that was largely directed by Icaria and run by European investigators, showed absolutely no effect of nitric oxide for the prevention of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Uh, the, there's really, one could look at all the different uh, strata, as the Kinsella study outlined, uh, absolutely no impact on survival uh, without BPD. And again, this was a different kind of baby who was enrolled in this study. These babies had very mild respiratory disease early, or they were included early. Uh, and so a lot of babies who are probably at low risk for BPD were being studied and included in this population. So how does one put all this together and think about overall where nitric oxide sits to reduce the risk for bronchopulmonary dysplasia? Well, about a year ago, we had a consensus conference meeting at the NIH, and a number of meta-analyses were done, and there was a couple of days of discussion and presentation. And the overall conclusion by this, this distinct uh, um, uh, committee was that available evidence does not support the use of nitric oxide in early routine, early rescue, or later rescue regimens in preterm infants. A lot of this is based on the meta-analysis findings. They stated that there are rare clinical situations, including pulmonary hypertension and lung hypoplasia, that have been inadequately studied. In other words, these babies are so profoundly ill that a lot of us in our, in our nurseries or intensive care units would use nitric oxide have seen dramatic improvements in oxygenation in selected babies, and yet because of the critical nature of their disease and the poor availability of parallel kinds of treatments, it's hard to induce or perform a randomized controlled trial, but there was recognition of perhaps that subgroup of premature infants are still good candidates for NO therapy. And then finally, the predefined subgroup and post hoc analyses of previous trials such as the Kinsella trial and what I showed you from the Ballard trial and others, which have suggested potential benefit of INO, have generated hypotheses for further research for clinical trials. So here we are then. We have some mixed data, and the question is what to do and how to further pursue this. I know there is a trial where they're repeating very much the Roberta Ballard approach, which uh, I think we should have some news on at, at some point fairly soon, I hope. <laughs> Uh, and there are other things that have come from the laboratory. We're investigating what is it about nitric oxide in that setting that works in some milieus but not others. So the ideas of these other downstream agents that we're using for pulmonary hypertension, such as sildenafil or the soluble guanylate cyclase activators, indeed we could find that they do restore lung structure, can prevent a lot of the chronic lung disease, and at least in vitro and some of the animal model studies, are more potent than nitric oxide itself because a problem with NO delivery, especially in the settings of oxidative stress, and that's a whole different story. The other approach is that perhaps VEGF nitric oxide signaling is, is too broad and one needs to focus on what other effects VEGF may have. 
that are not related to nitric oxide. And again, that's been an interesting area in our laboratory. And then finally, in the future, we're hoping that perhaps progenitor cell therapy. I think every talk ends with a progenitor cell therapy claim. <laughs> Ours is that if one takes human cord blood progenitors, uh, the so-called endothelial cell forming uh, colony units, or the ECFCs, uh, their form of progenitor cell, that if you inject them in mice, one can enhance lung structure and do it after the injury. So this may be a very enriched uh, area to still continue to pursue. So in conclusion then, this theme of translating discoveries into therapies, it does take a team, it takes a village, it takes expertise at multiple levels. And having a group working together, our example is when you go from the bench in terms of nitric oxide and its effects at birth and models of pulmonary hypertension and going back to the bedside to think about of using the acutely ill term newborn cardiac patients and those with respiratory failure evolved. The idea that it can act on preterm infants Preterm lambs, rather, means that perhaps inhaled NO for sick premature infants with pulmonary hypertension was another strategy. And then finally, all the laboratory work on how to enhance angiogenesis to improve alveolarization has led to a number of the approaches, perhaps the prevention of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. But again, that's a continuing saga that still needs to be grown. And then finally, I'd like to uh, uh, conclude by thanking members of our Heart Lung Center in Colorado especially our, our clinical team is in the upper photo. Uh, you can see John Kinsella is in the middle of the group there um, in the back. Uh, Dunbar Ivy wearing the red tie, again, head of our cardiology group. Kurt Stenmark, who's head of critical care, plays an essential role with our work. And so this shows a, a global team, again, of neonatologists, cardiologists, pulmonologists, and others. And then finally, an extensive lab group is shown in the, the lower panel. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Steve. Uh, I think we have uh, four or five minutes uh, for questions before we uh, take a break. And uh, I just want to remind and invite people uh, to attend the ribbon cutting ceremony and a structured tour of the new cardiac intensive care unit uh, at the hospital that will be open to patients next week. But we'd like to give you a tour today. Uh, upstairs, it's on the third floor. If you just go out to the main elevators, go up to the third floor turn around the corner uh, on the side opposite the cardiology clinic, you'll see the entrance to the new uh, cardiac ICU. It has some spectacular new technology features, some new design features. It's about thinking bigger and thinking differently uh, and uh, really reflects where we want to go in the future. But if we uh, uh, can uh, take five or six minutes for any questions uh, from the audience for Steve, I'm sure he'd be uh, happy to answer them. With regards to prenatal issues, I was wondering whether you thought the epigenetics of play a role in this as well. Absolutely, that's a great question. What's changed in terms of premature infants and the risk for chronic lung disease over time is that uh, care has gotten very good. I mean, I think with all the, from whether it's surfactant or the use of steroids or the lack of use of steroids or different things we do with airway care, all those measures, a lot of the postnatal related lung injury is dramatically improved. Yet the incidence of chronic lung disease has not changed. And as we've gone to more extremely preterm infants, there's been a more focus on what is it that's happening prenatally. And I think it's clear that the prenatal or fetal environment clearly sets the stage for risk of BPD completely independent of what we do postnatally even. So clearly the old BPD, the, the huge, the big signal was how to better ventilate, oxygenate, and not injure these babies. And now with such dramatic improvements, we still see persistence because of prenatal factors. We know there's a genetic component based on differences between monozygotic and dizygotic twins, for example. And there's experimental data that suggests even epigenetic factors might be very important. But those data are just beginning to evolve and haven't been applied yet. And I think that's a very uh, uh, rich area of investigation. It's very likely these epigenetic factors are important. Um, so 
effect, or is it um, across the spectrum of childhood? Yeah, that's a great question. So some of these anti-angiogenic agents are being used in, uh, in cancer trials with metastatic disease or different, different uh, um, scenarios. And indeed, the toxicities are all vascular. You know, one sees uh, renal issues from vascular problems, systemic hypertension, wound healing problems. And so it's really a, a major issue of how to handle cancer. When it comes to the lung and its susceptibility, clearly there are developmental differences. What we see with a single injection in our rat pups, for example, is lifelong in those pups. They sustain that impaired lung growth uh, during infancy and into adulthood. And that has us very concerned, of course, of using these agents in the, in the, in the extremely young uh, population. They do the same thing in adults. They get sick, but their lung structure really isn't affected unless you give them a second hit. So newborn rat pups, their lungs just don't grow. Adults, they get it. Their lungs are injured. You give them a second hit, they get bad pulmonary hypertension, some emphysema-type changes. But the susceptibility is very great in the young infant rat, at least. And what that means for the use of these agents in children, you know, I get very nervous about that. But uh, I'm, I'm concerned that it could be a problem. Again, excellent talk. Thank you. Um, you talked a lot about some of the alternate pathways and signaling. What about some of the nitric oxide precursors, and what do you think the role of those might be in uh, future laboratory and clinical work? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, certainly, you know, in the from the early days, the idea of using arginine as a way of enhancing nitric oxide production was pursued, and there were some promising early studies that suggested arginine treatment uh, in babies with pulmonary hypertension may be effective, but it hasn't been sustained. Likewise, in adults who have severe pulmonary hypertension, arginine had no impact in a clinical trial. And then finally, in pulmonary hypertension with sickle cell disease, some arginine trials have fallen short from the promise. So I don't think it's a very striking way of enhancing nitric oxide because of the complexity of NO signaling. There's so many endogenous inhibitors, for example, that even if you gave huge amounts of arginine, you can't overcome endogenous inhibition. Or there are other things through oxidative stress, which we know occurs in things like pulmonary hypertension or BPD, you inactivate the target, the SGC. And so even if you enhance NO production, it may still not be effective because SGC is a barrier. And then finally, we know oxidative stress upregulates PDE5. And so that's where knocking that down is part of the story. And so, so the, the precursor story still is, uh, is not clear. And I know some folks are looking at citrulline, you know, the Vanderbilt people, as perhaps a way of augmenting some of this. But I'm, um, I'm not quite sure where that's headed. And so perhaps, uh, perhaps you know that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The mantra of uh, critical care over the last decade or two has been that oxygen is bad. Uh, that being said, how do you deal with um, the, the um, variability and the caveats of being mile high with your uh, clinical and basic science research versus being at sea level? You know, that's a great question. And I remember years ago getting this question from a pediatric surgeon. And he asked me, is there something different about your kids at altitude from our kids at sea level? And I said, yeah, they learned to ski earlier. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I really think that is a caveat. But I think what it does is we have the same physiology. But it's nothing like being at altitude that really elicits and shows you the fr how, how fragile these kids can be. And so we use that as an example of perhaps then translating how to treat kids at, at, uh, at uh, sea level as well. In other words, what we've learned from apoxic reactivity in infants with pulmonary hypertension still translates with problems we face at sea level when we undertreat them with oxygen. What causes toxicity early may be very important or life-saving later. A recent trial in newborns, the support trial, right, showed that they were looking at retinopathy of prematurity, but babies who had lower oxygen, targeted lower saturations, actually had a worse survival than those with targeting more standard saturations. So to me, the way I think about oxygen, especially in the setting of prematurity, is that early on, a lot of the SATs to be lower, but it's time dependent. Later, once you try to bring the SATs, target SATs, they're a little bit higher. And absolutely, when the setting of bad pulmonary hypertension or bronchopulmonary dysplasia, uh, those kids need to have sustained improvements and more treatment with their supplemental oxygen. But that's, that's bias, yeah. <laughs>
So our last question goes to our chief of neonatology, Billy Short. <laughs> uh, yeah. Hi, Billy. How are you? Good. He's always a cheap date for our Colorado meeting because he lives in Colorado. So we always I just drive up the road. <laughs> yeah. Uh, would you like to comment? I think some of the difficulty with research in this area has been funding, and I know the Sedenafil trial had difficulty with that company supporting. I know it's, it's re coming back. Um, but I think getting uh, companies to take on diseases in newborn or in pediatrics in general is very difficult because we're such a small population, especially when you have a drug like Sidenafil where they're making millions of dollars for another use. So. Yeah, no, I think that's, uh, you've hit on a very important question that uh, could be a symposium in and of itself. You know, what should our relationship with industry be? And uh, certainly we've been long off the radar screen, especially when it came to older children with pulmonary hypertension. Uh, you know, getting uh, some of the early companies to think of endothelial receptor antagonists uh, to be used for pulmonary hypertension, even in adults, wasn't really there because they thought of it as being an extremely rare disease. There was no real profit motive early on. They thought, you know, there are many, many concerns, let alone translating that to pediatrics or newborns. And yet it was found that they could find through marketing and, and pricing and other things that it was very, they, they, uh, the, the pharmaceutical uh, uh, success story in terms of their uh, business plan with many of these agents has been remarkable. And it sparked new interest with new analogs, prostacyclin analogs, the ETRAs, the endothelin blockers, and, and so forth. So, so there's a, there is an interest there. The problem with kids, of course, is, um, you know, that's... Um, the, the adverse events issues, and, and people want to see that it's safe and utilized in adults before even thinking about kids. And had nitric oxide gone that route, you know, where they started with adults for whom there really is no approved indication, perhaps we wouldn't have had been able to develop it for, for kids. And so I think some of the thinking's wrong or backwards or doesn't recognize developmental biology or disease-specific pathophysiologic states. So there are many aspects of that question that are so intriguing and important. Uh, I can't do it real justice, but just some rambling thoughts. So let me thank again the Tobin family for uh, endowing and permitting this lecture and to uh, allow us to have this kind of intellectual discourse and to uh, try to push the frontiers back for diseases that affect uh, children who are critically ill. Uh, I also want to acknowledge in the audience uh, uh, Daniel Tasse, the chairman and CEO of Icaria, who is a company who makes nitric oxide and has been so dedicated to devoting their resources to clinical trials uh, in children and has funded much of the work that has pushed the frontier forward and been a big supporter of the Children's Hospital, Mr. Cohen, and other sponsors uh, of critical care medicine. We thank you for being here and we thank Dr. Abden uh, for delivering the 33rd annual Calvin Memorial Lecture. So thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, please join us upstairs. If the coffee's cold up here, it's hot on the third floor. You can go <laughs> up the main elevators to the third floor. Uh, you can uh, join us for a tour. Okay.